Good morning, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Kira Blackwell. I'm the program executive for NASA iTech. I want to welcome you today to our cycle two. Today, you'll see the next five uh, of the top 10 technologies that are being presented that are really attempting to disrupt the market. It's hard to believe, actually, that this program started a year ago, which is why I'm going to do something that Harlow will probably kill me for. But I'm going to bring my team up because, you know, things run smoothly and you think it runs smoothly because of me, but it really doesn't run because of me. Harlow, can you come up for a second? Uh, Tom, Tim, and Gina, you've supported me with comms. Come on. <laughs> These are the people that, well, let me wait for Jeannie to get up here. But these are the people that actually help make my job easy every day. Uh, when you look at all the work that's being done and it runs so smoothly and it looks easy, it's really not. It's because of them. And uh, when I want to throw in the towel sometimes because it's frustrating and we're working you know, way, well into the night, um, they're the ones that encourage me to keep going. And uh, so I just wanted to thank you guys. And if you guys can give them a round of applause, because I couldn't do it without you. What is NASA iTech for, for those of you that haven't been here before? Because there are some. It's a unique approach. Maybe if I can change that, I'll just change it this way, maybe. How about there? Uh, NASA iTech is a, a unique approach to identifying cutting edge technologies that are actually solving problems here on Earth and also have the potential to solve problems in space for us. It's a new way of us doing it. Um, part of the reason we do it is so that we can stimulate innovation outside of the agency by helping the entrepreneurs maintain their IP, stimulate jobs by them growing a business, and we provide a platform within a government agency that allows them to present these technologies to people that potentially will be interested in investing in them or taking the technology further. And NASA looks at it from a space application perspective on how that technology could actually be rolled into um, helping solve some of our challenges in space. And so without the entrepreneurs, I also couldn't do it. So thank you guys for your time and, and, and applying and being here. You guys are embarking on a tough road ahead, and I'm talking to the entrepreneurs. When you face roadblocks, you'll want to throw in the towel. Um, and when you can't see a path forward, you're going to ask yourself, why am I doing this again? But it's, it helps, actually, to know that there are people out there that have traveled that same road that you're embarking on. And it's important to know that they've actually made it through it, that they've disrupted a market and survived. They had successes. They've had failures. But... They're still, they're still here today and moving things forward. So just keep that in mind when you're ready to throw in the towel because you guys, you're going to face it. You're going to have people who aren't going to want you to succeed, not because what you're doing isn't important, but because it's infringing upon an area in which it threatens another market that exists. But keep in mind that the people who have actually traveled that road that you're building your technology upon. They've put in the same sweat and tears. They've, they've stayed committed so that you could be here today. And in the future, the, entrepreneur, the entrepreneurs that will follow you, they will need you to have succeeded so that they can build upon your technology and move it forward. So, you know, just be encouraged by that. The person that I've invited actually to speak today, he's, uh, I've actually witnessed him have successes and failures. 
he has played a huge role in disrupting our space industry. He has walked the very path that you're embarking upon. And with those successes and failures, I've watched him handle them both with grace and dignity of a great leader. He may not be the most vocal in our commercial space industry, but his company is by far the most successful because his company is actually making a profit off doing this and has been successfully for 10 years. So I brought him in today so that he can actually encourage you as you're going down that path to know, don't give up. So if you guys can uh, give me a round of applause as I welcome Mark Serangelo. He's the, he's the corporate vice president for Sierra Nevada Corporation and he is building the Dream Chaser. It is my pleasure to be here to, to be supportive, I think, of what not only what Kira and iTech is doing, but Steve, who's been able to make this all work as well, to, to be able to give you a little insight into how this journey happens. I know there's a, no, a number of new entrepreneurs. It wasn't very long that I was sitting on that side trying to take my company and get it funded. You learn rejection really well, as many of you probably have found out. You knock on a lot of doors for a long time. My particular part of this story, which we'll go into here in a minute, is uh, one day, uh, about 15 years ago, I decided it would be a really good idea with about 20 people to go build a replacement for the space shuttle. And uh, that was not a, an idea that was universally accepted, as you could probably imagine, since there were about 10,000 people working on the space shuttle program at that time. But we, uh, we embarked on a company. I run a entrepreneurial space company. Uh, I was part of what's now known as the commercial space flight industry. I was one of the founders of that particular group, uh, Commercial Space Flight Federation. And it was a group that really looked at space and said, maybe there's a way to do this a little bit differently, a little bit more aggressively, a little bit more commercially, and take it to a different level. And over the uh, period of time since I started this, we've had a fair amount of work and success. Uh, it's 26 years of space flight now, uh, over 430 missions. We've built a lot of hardware, about 4,000 things have gone to space. Last year, we launched something every three weeks or so. Uh, four different business units in different parts of space with 40 clients around the world and 30 strategic partners. And over 70 missions for NASA, which has been a, a real thrill for us, some of the most prominent NASA missions. I think as importantly for this particular group, we, went, we embarked on this road not only to do interesting, fascinating, difficult things, but to make it a business. We've been profitable now since uh, now about 13 years. We grew about 20% a year, 20 to 25% a year since that period of time. Uh, about a $2 billion business now from uh, starting in a, in a garage in San Diego. So we, we know that road. But it's a road of both technology, business, success. As Kira said, a lot of failure along the way probably more failure than I, I care to remember. I tell the story that if I was playing baseball, I'd be failing seven out of 10 times and being paid $20 million a year as a batter. Uh, failure is defined by the industry and the, and the area that you're in. And failure in this industry is, is pretty difficult. Uh, we've been fortunate through this journey to do things that I would have never imagined. Uh, we've been to seven planets with something that we've built. We've been now the closest we've gone to the sun, and we've been on a mission that has gone uh, just about the furthest, past, uh, past Pluto to uh, and beyond on New Horizons. We visited comets and asteroids and been to Mars as many times as any company uh, that's in the space industry. So it's been quite an interesting journey, but it's a journey that's about steps. And I, uh, I show this picture because I, I like to show the progress um, as you guys are, are going through your journey. This is the history of the Mars rover program from the original uh, experts of the uh, uh, parts of doing that all the way to what's now on Mars. And Curiosity is about the size of a Mini Cooper, 1,600 pounds. And that journey has really gone a different way. And as you build up your business, as you'll see, it's an incremental journey. It doesn't make huge leaps. It takes a long time to get there. But it does do pretty spectacular things when you do make it. And a lot of this started for me as a kid. I'm a fourth generation 
pilot, and I've always had a, a fascination with aerospace, fascination with what we're doing. And I just, as many of us have done, looked up to the stars. And for me, the movie that uh, made a big difference was the movie 2001. I don't know how many of you have seen it. How many of you have seen it? Well, the music in that movie came from the 1800s. It was Strauss. The book was written by a guy by the name of Arthur Clarke. He started writing it in 1948, before there was a space program. And he imagined at that time a commercial spaceship going to a commercial space station. And this is a film that came out in 1968. And when I saw it, and I started realizing in, in my head, well, maybe there's something, as a little boy, uh, uh, I saw it after it came out, but I said, maybe there's something in this. But if you look at the scenes, imagining it's now written over 50 years ago and produced 40 years ago, that's not much different than what I'm actually producing. And the imagination of people like that, to see that far ahead, and to be pretty right is an, is an amazing thing. I'm uh, going to talk a little bit today about the vehicle called the HL20. And you're not allowed to laugh at these videos because this one's from the 1980s. And the uh, NASA had worked on a program called the HL20 for many years. And what you're hearing in the background is, is a series of talks about how they got there and this whole journey about how the design happened. By the mid 60s. I'm going to stop it here in a minute, but there, we need all need, need a little humor. There was a very special vehicle that NASA used to get this off the ground. And people tell me that NASA can't be innovative. So that was the tow vehicle for the first HL, for the first vehicle. 20. They moved up in class to a B-52 later on in life. But uh, it was a program. And I'll move on. It was a program that was designed to create a reusable small spaceship. And NASA worked on it for many, many years, uh, was very successful at it in, in many ways. But for a variety of reasons, it got stopped. And it got put into literally a garage and a hangar here in Langley, Virginia, and basically forgotten about. And one of the things that I looked at when I was look, trying to start my part of this business was to say, what can we do, rather than starting from scratch, because I didn't have enough money, obviously, to build a space shuttle or anything like that. But we went around and we looked and said, let's build on something that's already happened. And we found, in the NASA archives, this program. This program with about 10 years' worth of work, uh, about $600 million of research, a lot of great people, both here at NASA as well as all over. And they, and they said, we looked at it and said, well, let's find a way maybe to take this technology and move it out. So literally, we came here down in uh, Langley in 2004, knocked on the door and said, can we borrow your HL-20? And basically, everybody looked at with lots of blank stares. And they said, what's an HL-20 for the most part? And it was a vehicle that was actually, the boxes were in a corner of a, of a hangar. There was a mock-up that was under tarp. The tarp was full of bird crap. And it was uh, not something that was in the forefront of anybody's thinking. But what was behind it is what was really special. There were a lot of brilliant people who would look at the design and validated the design. So much so that what they did now with the supercomputers we have now, one quarter, one percent off of the perfect design using slide rules and using pencils. Uh, that's the key for us. And, and I know many of you are taking technologies out. We took that technology, we moved it, we were able to license it out, and then we woke up the next day and said, we don't have any money. How do we do this? Uh, and the shuttle was still flying at the time. The bet we made was at some point in time, the space shuttle was going to retire. And at some point in time, NASA was going to need to find another vehicle to go to space that looked like that. But it was probably not going to be the space shuttle all over again. It's probably going to be something smaller, lighter, more efficient. And we started down that road. And I put this picture up because it's one of my favorite. Uh, it is a, a very iconic picture from the space program. But what it also did, it was the first time that humans had actually seen the Earth in that fashion. And it changed the world in a way that's a little bit different. It started what is now the mono, modern ecological movement. People began to realize we live on a planet that needs to be taken care of. And that series of photos and what we did actually started to change the world. This is uh, one of my other favorite pictures. It is the delivery system for Spirit and, op and Opportunity, 
the two Mars rovers. And if you could imagine standing in front of a room of really smart people like this and saying, we're going to take your billion dollar rover, we're going to put it into a beach, big beach ball, we're going to throw it out of a spacecraft, we're going to let it hit Mars, bounce maybe 5, 10, 20, 30 times, it's going to stop perfectly on a very flat surface, it's going to deflate and the rovers are going to drive off unharmed. But when you did that pitch, everybody looked at you like you were crazy. Well, they went through every other way of getting there and they realized maybe it's not so crazy. The point of that is that maybe you're not so crazy. You're doing stuff that people might look at you, look at you weird, look at you like you, they don't know what you're doing, but there's been a lot of weird stuff, a lot of crazy stuff, a lot of very difficult stuff that actually turns out to be the perfect solution. That brown building was the place where all these records were housed and nobody even really knew how to get into it at the time. And what we had found was a program that looked like this. A lot of work had been done, a lot of interesting work, but it really didn't go any further. In 2004, we also launched the first commercial small satellite. Uh, and I'm doing a little bit of a timeline on my history here, but this uh, satellite was called Chipsat. We launched it, and what made it special, and it's generally in history as it's seen as one of the first small satellites, was the first satellite that we could control from the internet. So I could use my laptop and control the satellite. And in 2004, that was a really big deal. Uh, 2004 was also the time where New Horizons was launched, and that mission was launched on a journey that was going to take about 12 years from, and it took about four years to start, and the people who were brought on that program were intentionally brought on that program as on the younger side of management because they realized it was going to be such a long journey. Uh, 2016, 12 years later, we wound up get, making it to, uh, to Pluto, and this picture is one of the more iconic pictures that came out of that. These are, uh, in, our, in our production center, the next generation of those satellites, and they were launched uh, uh, as, a, as a group, actually. There were 16 of them launched on one. And in 2016, after, after about 12 years, we wound up winning one of the contracts for the NASA Commercial Cargo Program. It was a $3 billion contract. So that journey of 12 years from basically starting nowhere to where we are now, this is what it looks like when you win a contract after all the time. Uh, but uh, when we uh, were all done and took this journey, we were able to build a spaceship that looks like this. And this uh, spaceship is very, very special to us, but it's very special for a lot of reasons. It's built on a lot of history. And every time I speak, I try to speak to the place that I'm just a passenger on this journey. There have been thousands, literally thousands of people at NASA, companies, contractors, we took a very different approach than some other companies in commercial space. We have a lot of partners. We have over 30 partners. We've worked now with virtually all the NASA centers, including Langley. We think it's a good thing to have partnerships and to respect the past. And I, I love this little brother, big brother picture because it does, that's actually to scale. It does show what it is that we're trying to do. But as importantly, we were able to start flying this vehicle. And in a very sp uh, unintentionally special way, we wound up doing our first flight on the same day, same time, same place as the last flight of Shuttle Enterprise, the last test flight of Shuttle Enterprise. We are currently out with the second generation of the vehicle in flight test in Mojave right now at the Armstrong Research Center. And this, uh, this picture was uh, also a very special picture for us. We are being housed in the same housing, the uh, same hangar as the, uh, as the shuttle has been. And uh, while the, uh, you can see the scale's a little bit different, the program manager's still walking around with a, a clipboard after all these years, and it's a, it's a really good thing. Uh, we have taken that program and have started to commercialize it. We have uh, now announced the first ever mission for the United Nations. And the United Nations has a space agency. For those of you who don't know, there are 84 countries that are part of it, including the United, including the United States. And we're able to, uh, to start that program. From that, we have been fortunate to win a new contract to do what might be the next generation space station. It's called the Gateway. And that contract is about to start, and we're uh, going to build a full-scale ground prototype of what it's, it might look like. This is our, <clears throat> our rendering of what that space station will look like. The idea here is that NASA would produce uh, with its partners this space station and move it. Move it to be in orbit in, around the moon or move it to be in orbit around Mars. So I look back on the journey and I say, in now 40 years ago, there was this idea on film of having a commercial spaceship going to a commercial space station. And I realized that how improbable and possible it might be for someone like me who came not out of any particular place, 
came off of a, a out of a rural environment and in a city environment, not growing up in in NASA, to be able to take a company with a, gr a terrific group of people, a lot of partners, and find ourselves in a place where we're actually doing what was in that movie that I watched when I was a boy, building a space station and a commercial space plane. And the point of all this is not to the journey here has been really hard. But the point of all this is really to say that everything we do makes a first step. Everything you're doing makes a first, is it takes a first step. And your first step is here, is getting people interested, people who know what they're doing, people who want to help, people like NASA and what the iTech community are doing, opening doors to make that happen. And a few final comments, and I'll get off the stage, about what I've learned in this journey. One of the things that I learned is to have people around me that love what they do, because it gets really hard, it gets really difficult. And uh, Asmanoff, who uh, I actually got to meet before he died, said this, if he was in heaven, he'd do exactly what he's doing right now forever. And as an entrepreneur, if you can say that, it's, you're going to have that energy during the really bad times to make it to the next level. I don't know how many of you know, but Walt Disney was the first sp spokesperson for NASA. Uh, back in the late 1950s, when they were putting NASA together, they reached out and they said, who is the best communicator of the time? and it was Walt Disney. And, uh, and I think that's a really smart way of thinking. And what I took from that and what I've learned from that is that there are a lot of people around who can be helpful to you. Some of them are in the industry, some of them are not. And in this case, this very interesting dual relationship happened where they went out and got some help from Disney to how to promote this idea of space. The whole Mercury 7 came out of that conversation. And what happened in return, which was really interesting, was Disney then got very interested in the future. And in fact, built into, his, uh, into the um, charter for his company that 25% of the work in all the um, museum parks were going to be about tomorrow, which is why we have Tomorrowland, which is why we have Space Mountain. And he then embraced the fact that he's got not only helping, but he was also going to take that and make his own business and his own future different and better. Uh, my favorite person in the aviation industry is Alexander Graham Bell which is not somebody you would normally associate with airplanes. But he, uh, he took a tack when the Wright brothers were flying. He went to go partner with them. They didn't want him to partner with them. So he turned around and said, well, maybe I'm going to go do something a little different. And he and his wife funded an organization which became known as AEA. It's the first aerospace uh, association ever created. They also created the first X Prize that was ever created. And what they did was just a minor little thing. They figured out that the Wright brothers had one big problem with their airplane. They couldn't turn it, which is a real big problem with an airplane. You can't go in straight lines. Uh, so he took and modernized the concept of airlines, rudders, and be able to change the wings. And every airplane since then has basically had that concept. So Bell helped that along, and he did that using the power of partnerships, using the power of young people. Uh, one of the people in this picture, the guy leaning in from the left, happened to be a guy by the name of Curtis Wright. Curtis, Glenn Curtis, who went on to then form Curtis Airplane Company, and then eventually, in a little bit of history, bought out the Wright brothers later on. So it's, it's a really wild world sometimes. And uh, I show this picture because I love Ferris wheels. But Ferris wheels, to me, sometimes you're, you feel like you're on the bottom. But if you stick around long enough, and part of it is being able to survive, you're able to, to find that road back. And as I end, I end with my favorite entrepreneur, who's uh, Gandhi. And people laugh because I put this up, but everything I've done fits into those words. And everything you've done probably fits into those words. First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. And the journey of an entrepreneur basically are those four steps for me. They, they ignored me for years. They said it would never work. This, who is this kid who's going off to build a space shuttle with 50 people? And then after a while, they laughed because we tried to do something that had never been done before. Then some people woke up and realized, well, maybe they might get it done, and they began fighting it. And eventually, we got to a place where we won the contract. And it's not just Dream Chaser. It's virtually everything I've done fits into that. So as I close out here, I just wanted to say that from my perspective, dreams don't have an expiration date. You guys are doing something that's really hard, but it's worth it because you wouldn't be here if it wasn't. You're going to do something that can change the world. You can do something that makes the world better. And you're going to do something that someday, in a few years, I hope you get coming back up here and talk to the next group of people that are able to come back. So thank you very much.